Here is our the last but at least speaker of this first session. Um, so the speaker is uh, Laura Maripini, and the title is Tours Providing a More Realistic Battery Model in INET. So please welcome the speaker with a big applause. <laughs> okay, so I'm Laura. I'm going to be talking about some work I've done um, implementing uh, the hybrid key BAM battery model in INET. And this is interesting for three reasons. Um, one is that it's, it's good to have a better, uh, a more detailed battery model. It also enables certain kinds of network analysis that we can't do with some of the existing battery models. And finally, it um, reveals a couple of issues in the um, power management framework in INET that, that hopefully we can address um, in the future. So quick outline of the talk. I'm going to start with math and chemistry. I know we haven't had our coffee break yet, but you're just going to have to live with it. Then I'm going to talk a little bit more generally about um, simulating power consumption, how we do it in INET and then talk about some of the issues we had putting the key, hybrid keybound model into INET. We actually did do some validation. We have a battery discharge test bed at Uppsala University. And then I'll talk about some of the um, kinds of evaluation that we can enable um, with that, with the new functionality. So networking researchers, when we think about batteries, we generally think of them as relatively simple. It's kind of a bucket of charge. You perform some activities, they consume charge, you take charge out of the bucket, eventually the bucket is empty and the battery is dead. Um, in fact, batteries are, are rather complicated. This picture is a scanning electron microscope photograph of the inside of a lithium battery. Um, unfortunately, we don't get to work at that level of abstraction. Nevertheless, a battery is a very complex electro electrochemical system. Its behavior depends very heavily on the battery chemistry and structure on the intensity and timing of the applied load and external factors such as temperature. Most of our work is, looks at lithium coin cells. So these are um, small, non-rechargeable, inexpensive, lightweight batteries, the sort of thing that you might use in a body area network or on a very small sensor or in kind of IoT type applications. And um, battery, it's an anode, cathode, um, with an electrolyte and separator between them. Um, and when you discharge the battery, um, the lithium anode is oxidized. We get lithium ions, electrons. Um, lithium ions diffuse through the electrolyte. Um, the electrons diffuse through the load. We usually call that current. And then the manganese dioxide, dioxide cathode is reduced to form lithium manganese dioxide. Um, and this is a, a non-reversible chemical reaction, so that's why this is a non-rechargeable battery. Um, we usually describe the load on a battery in terms of the current as a function of time. So here we can think about a, a, a load current versus time where we draw 10 milliamps for 6.2 milliseconds. And that would be the sort of load you would see um, with, say, a Zigbee transmitter. We can kind of, we can superimpose that load, so again, 10 milliseconds, six, 10 milliamps, 6 milliseconds, over an oscilloscope trace of the battery output voltage under that load. And so we start with some initial voltage. Um, we see a very rapid drop in the output voltage. That's the internal <coughs> resistance of the battery. Um, since now we're drawing a current through the battery, that resistance causes a voltage drop. And then we see that there's a, the, the voltage continues to drop. This isn't quite horizontal here. And that reflects the ability of the electrochemical reactions inside the battery to keep up with the demand. Here, it, it can't quite keep up, so the voltage <coughs> is beginning to drop while we're drawing this current. And then at the end, the load, um, the load is released, the load is taken away. We get an immediate recovery. Again, that's the internal resistance of the battery. We're no longer drawing a current through it. And then we see here that the voltage continues to increase for a while after we've taken away the load. And what's happening is that those lithium ions are diffusing through the electrolyte um, while the battery has load being drawn. When the load is taken away, that diffusion process relaxes. 
and we get what's called charge recovery. So this is, this is what the output voltage of a, of a battery does um, when you put a load on it. Um, in general, uh, we can think of batteries as having very nonlinear characteristics. One of the most important ones is called the rate capacity effect. And what that means is that the lower the current you use to discharge the battery, uh, the more efficiently, the more charge you can get out of the battery. So for example, if you double the current, you will decrease the lifetime by more than half. And this is some data from our test bed. Um, here, the red is a very low discharge current, 0.2 milliamps. We can extract quite a lot of, of the capacity from the battery. Here, if we use a 25 milliamp load, we extract very little capacity from the battery. Um, the, the charge is still in there, but we can't extract it at the um, current we need. The other important nonlinear characteristic is charge recovery. And what that means is that an intermittent load discharges the battery more efficiently. So if you operate your battery on a 50% duty cycle, you will more than double the lifetime. So here you can see um, this is discharging the battery um, continuously, 25 milliamps. I'm sorry, continuously 25 milliamps here in the red. Um, and then here, where we, dis we discharge it um, at a 1% duty cycle. We get a much longer lifetime. A couple of other important nonlinear characteristics. Um, these are cheap batteries. A lot of the sensor hardware we run them in is cheap hardware. So you get a lot of manufacturing variation. Um, batteries, even from the same manufacturer, even from the same batch, will show you know, considerable variation in the amount of charge you can extract. And even the hardware varies. Sometimes the same operations on different devices, nominally identical, you get um, kind of different current draws. Another important external factor is temperature. In general, the colder the temperature, um, the lower the battery lifetime. So the point is that we've got kind of a, not of, a lot of non-linear things going on. The other thing that's important is that when we think about device failure, it's not when the battery runs out of capacity. It's when the battery can no longer maintain the output voltage necessary um, to power the electronics. So it's actually dependent on the electronics not on the battery. Um, and what you can see here, so this is, this is a long discharge. It's over several weeks. Um, this is kind of a, a canonical discharge pattern. Um, it's identical pattern. We have a, a long discharge, long discharge at low load. So that's these, these decreases here. And we have the recovery up here. And then we also have these very short impulse loads, loads at very high current. And what we see is that the battery behavior, these are identical loads, but as the battery discharges, the behavior changes. Eventually, um, so say the device electronics cut off is two volts. Eventually, um, we cross that threshold, the device switches off. You're not getting enough voltage to power the electronics. Even though once we take away the load, we're actually recovering up to um, a higher voltage. So we're kind of leaving charge in the battery, but we can't get it. There's still charge in the battery, there's still capacity in the battery, but we can't get it out at the voltage we need. And so that's when we get failure. Um, so the question is, how much do these nonlinearities matter? So we've done some work um, using a, a very basic model, and we show that um, when you're kind of looking at the time average current, when you're using a very simple model, um, you expect certain loads with similar average current to have the same discharge time, we actually find variations of about 15 to 20 percent um, when, when you take some of these nonlinearities into account. It's even more important when you're trying to do absolute estimations of lifetime. The linear models just aren't very good. You, you can really be off by, by a factor of two or three just using the linear assumptions. So hopefully I've convinced you that we need to do something. So modeling batteries, um, it's an important scientific activity in its own right. Um, it's a very open field. Generally four kinds of models. Empirical models, you do a lot of measurements over the batteries and loads you care about, you do a lot of curve fitting. Electrochemical models, this is what uh, electrochemists do. They model the battery as a chemical system. It's very slow, very complex, very complex parameterization. And some of our recent work shows that some, a lot of the existing models actually aren't very good for these very fine-grained sort of millisecond 
scale loads that we've been looking at. Our work is based on a combination of analytic and equivalent circuit models. An analytic model says abstract the battery using, using some analytic model and compute the output voltage as a function of the, the output voltage as a function of time as a function of the um, current load as a function of time. <coughs> an equivalent circuit model um, treats, by contrast, treats the battery as an electrical system, generally some kind of an RLC circuit. So resistor, resistor inductor capacitor circuit tunes the parameters for the circuit as a function of time, as a function of battery state, and then just solves the differential equations for the battery as an electrical system. So our model is a combination of those two. It's called KeyBAM. So it's, it's a well-known model by Newman and others. Um, it's an analytic model for the state of charge of a battery. And what we do is we pretend the battery has two wells of charge, a well that's called the available charge and a well that's called the bound charge or the unavailable charge. We say that the battery has reached zero state of charge when there's no more available charge. We drain available charge as current. So we, we pull current from the available charge. Current, if you don't remember from high school, is charge per unit time. We um, supply the available charge through this valve here of size K from the bound charge. And what we said, and that, that actually gives us some of the behaviors we want. It's a, it's a very simple model, but it's going to give us some of the behaviors we want because if we drain the current very, very quickly, we'll drain the available current before it's had time to be replenished from the bound current. So having a very, very high current means that the battery will drain quickly, leaving a lot of stranded charge. By contrast, if we drain with a very low current, the bound charge will be able to replenish the available charge quickly enough to keep the available charge full. Similarly, if we have an intermittent discharge, we stop drawing current every so often, and we have time for, current, for charge to flow from the bound current well to the available current well. And you can write this as a system of differential equations. We're deleting the math because it's too early in the morning. Um, but the upshot is that you can write it in terms of fairly simple closed forms, so it's not very expensive to commute. You're not doing a lot of approximations or iterations. It's, it's closed forms. And basically, so if you remember this figure, what we're doing is we're, we're using those differential equations to kind of get this general shape. This, this, it, it's a differential equation. We solve it with a bunch of exponentials, and you can get, we use it to get kind of this general shape um, of the state of charge. The parameterization is very, very complex. It involves doing complex measurements of highly controlled loads. It's very specific to the, the battery. But in terms of putting it in, in um, Omnet, not a big deal. So KeyBAM only gives us the state of charge. It tells us what's in the available charge well. We want to find out the voltage. So what we do is we hook that up to a logical circuit. Um, and what we say is it's an R RC circuit. Um, the internal resistance of the battery, and then some kind of transient behaviors. We use the key bound state of charge then as the input value, the input voltage to that circuit, and again, we can just solve that as a system of differential equations. Math deleted. Um, but again, it's simple closed forms, um, easy, easy enough to compute. And here what we're doing is we're using that, that transient response to model this very detailed, if you remember this, this discharge, we had the internal resistance drop here and then the battery continuing to drop here as the electrochemical processes fail to keep up. Um, and those, 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 those look pretty much like exponentials and we treat them as exponentials. We're modeling them via the RC circuit. So hopefully I've convinced you that batteries are really complicated. Hopefully I've convinced you that we have some math, which I've deleted, which we can use to model them. Next step, of course, is to think about how we simulate a system that includes a battery. Basically, we have to do four things. We have to model the activity on the device. We have to see what kind of a load that will generate. We have to apply the load to the battery. And then the battery has to do something to inform the device about the status of the battery. Going through those one at a time, device activity, so in the device. Um, most of what we do, since we're not battery chemists, is we're modeling some kind of a protocol or an application. 
Generally speaking, we take the, um, the lowest level element in the simulation and treat that as modeling the device operation. So if this is a, just a conventional um, INET host, um, usually we do that in the radio, for example. We model the, the state changes in the radio. It doesn't have to be that way. We could have a much higher level model um, that say only modeled the packets. We, we still have to have some way to generate the load um, and inform the battery about it. Um, and of course, in a real device, you might have several components, the radio, the processor, a sensor, all draining current. So this is the part that we, we kind of all know. We, we model the operation of a, of a wireless interface, MAC layer protocols, and so forth. Um, the interesting part is actually modeling the load. How do we translate um, the operation of a MAC layer or the operation of a radio into load on the battery? Um, and we do that by introducing another module. This actually came in as, as early as the, the original Mixeme Energy Framework. It's continued in the um, INET um, power subsystem. We actually instantiate a com consumer module whose job is to translate device, device activity into load. Um, so it takes some state information from the device, that the, for example, that the radio is transmitting, and translates that device activity into a load on the battery. Um, it can do that, for example, by taking um, data sheet information, information about the hardware, and just looking up um, what the load value should be. And then the, the cons it's actually the consumer that then that's the interface to the battery. So if we have, um, again, this kind of current over time, we, we have a piece of state information that, for example, that the transmitter is transmitting with a certain power. We say, oh, the current has gone up to this value. Then we get a piece of information that the radio has gone back to sleep. We take the current back down to some value. And that, that's basically how all the simulators work. Um, you know, not, not, ju not, just I, um, not just INET. The load, again, we'd like to support, um, oops. And again, I, I, the point I wanted to make here was just that um, you want to be able to support diverse representations of loads. You don't necessarily want to have to model the radio. You may not model a sensor or a processor in the same way that you model the radio. Radio generally uses Omnet signaling interface. You might need to do something completely different um, to model how a sensor interacts with the environment and what kind of a load it's going to put on the sensor. So that, that's, that's one of the reasons why this consumer is important. That's where all the intelligence about how you interact between your application or your domain-specific model and its energy consumption. So basic battery model used in energy framework, in the INET power consumption, Castalia, is milliamp hour model. So we have current as a function of time. Every time some state changes on the device, we get a new value of the current. And we just do a piecewise sum. Charge is the integral of current over time. We smooth everything out um, and just to say, here's how much charge we consumed, charge consumed, charge consumed, charge consumed, for whatever operations are, are consuming charge at any given time. We have some nominal battery capacity in terms of charge, milliamp hours. So each time we have a state change, we simply drain I times T charge from the battery. Then we need to, to the battery is considered to be depleted when the charge goes to zero. We shut down the device. And this is actually trickier than you'd think because all of the modules need to know that the underlying device is dead. You can't have some application module somewhere that doesn't know about batteries, doesn't care about batteries, um, sit there and still generating statistics because it doesn't realize that the, all the underlying hardware is dead. And in um, INET, we have the lifecycle manager to handle that. And so we can pass state informa information about the status of the battery back to the device via the lifecycle manager. Something that that doesn't give us the ability to do is to pass kind of other kinds of status information. And one of the rather important ones is being able to model 
the device's own ability to estimate its state of charge. So you're all looking at your laptops, you have that little battery icon, um, your device is trying to estimate, your, your laptop is estimating its remaining charge. You'd like to be able to do that, um, model being able to do that on the device. So looking at basically what we've got going on here, um, the INET power consumption model, it's basically exactly what we said. We have the, the radio. Um, the radio uses omnet signals to, to announce a state change. We have a state-based consumer that listens for those signals, looks up the power consumption associated with all of those state changes, and passes the information to the battery model. Um, so it's no big deal. We just dump KeyBAM right in the energy storage slot and take those values. We've got one minor issue with doing that, and that is that the power model for INET is currently oriented toward watts and joules. So here, these are the um, interfaces in the, in the contract, um, and we can see that you set the power consumption um, in terms of watts, and you get power consumption back in watts, and matching up the nominal capacity and the residual capacity are both defined in terms of joules, which is perfectly, which is perfectly consistent, but it's not current. And the energy storage um, base class, which is the book, bookkeeping interface for adding up all of the different devices that can be operating on the device and generating the, the final value of the load, defines all of its entries in terms of watts. And if you probably remember, I've been talking about current. Um, we need one last bit of math. Power, which is watts, is current times voltage. This is the right way to model constant voltage sources. So things like mains power. If you're simulating a data center, um, all of the devices in the data center are going to be described in terms of watts. Simple battery models that don't have an internal voltage model, same thing. There, the lifetime can only depend on the capacity because you're not going to, you, you don't really, in some ways, you don't really have a lifetime in a, in a data center. Um, you ju you're just seeing how much power you're drawing. A simple battery model, you just turn off the battery. Um, for more complex models, we have current is charge, drawing charge as a function of time. The output voltage varies, and the lifetime depends on the output voltage. So we would like a way, and we'll talk, hopefully talking with Levente a little bit, about how we can support both, both interfaces, both kinds of interfaces in INET. So we have a model. We have Omnet. We've got a simulation. We should actually see how well it compares to reality. So this is at Uppsala University. It's a battery test bed. We have a bunch of custom cards that put controlled loads across lithium coin cells, CR2032 batteries. Um, and this lets us measure um, simple resistive loads and simple timing patterns. We actually wanted to measure a lot of batteries, use a lot of different loads. Um, so we needed something that was um, large scale and low cost. So we've got a bunch of cards and they sit in the box and they blink. Everything works better if they blink. Experiments that can blow up, if you, if you undercharge a battery, can blow up. Good science. I mean, it's not often that you're a computer scientist and you get to do something that can catch fire and blow up. Um, and so what we did is we took um, the INET 802.15.4 Mac layer, um, which, is, which is based on Nixim, and we combined that with our hybrid KeyBAM battery model. And what we do is we, in, in that case here, what the current versus time load looks like is that we have a back off it's some variable amount. There's, it's a binary exponential back off in the um, MAC layer. We transmit a data frame, and then we receive an acknowledgment. So that's, that's the shape of the load. That's what, that's what the um, trace of the MAC layer does, the state changes in the MAC layer does, that's what the consumer generates. And we can mimic that same load in our test bed. So we just set up the test bed to drain the batteries on this load, and we simulate a network where that load is being drained. Uh, it's not as good as you'd hope. Um, here the red and the green light colored lines are the um, open circuit and maximum load voltages that we see. So we get a lifetime <coughs> when the, the voltage here goes down to about two volts. Um, KeyBAM is very aggressive. It takes the voltage 
down below two volts almost twice as quickly. This isn't actually too surprising. Um, KeyBAM is a very aggressive, it's a, it's a well-known model, it's very aggressive. Most people report that it, it drains batteries too quickly. Um, it's, still, it's still very much an open question how to simulate these very small batteries. Um, so why do we care? Well, you, people do a lot of performance evaluation and dimensioning. I have a protocol. It's 5% more energy efficient than your protocol. I write a paper about it. Um, it, it so it's nice to use good battery, battery models for that. It's important to remember that the load needs to be simulated with comparable accuracy. Before, we had this very linear model, so you could just model the radio and assume that the additional load caused by the sensor or by the processor or something else didn't really matter. Here, it's, it's a nonlinear model. All of these effects are combined together. And so you need to have a comparably accurate model of the rest of the device in order for the very detailed battery model to be meaningful. Um, but something that we do want to do, and something I think it's very important, is modeling on-device state, state of charge estimation. So you have a, your phone or your, your um, laptop the battery actually has chips from TI in it, three or four chips from TI, telling you how much battery you have left. It's a hard problem to do online, on-device, um, state of charge estimation. Um, if you have a very small sensor device, something like powered by something like a coin cell, you can't do that. And we don't actually have a good sense of how to do that state of charge estimation. And it's very important for, things that, for doing things like informing a user when the batteries are about to run out, or for doing something like load or lifetime balancing. If you have a sensor network, you deploy wireless sensors to cover an area, and then kind of the whole network fails as soon as one of those sensors fails. So you want to balance the sensing load and the communication load across all the sensors. So there, the performance of that sort of a, a protocol depends very heavily on the accuracy of that estimation. And that's something that we really don't know. It's not incorporated into the simulators. You just kind of look up what the true value is, and that's going to be exactly, in your simulated world, what the true value is. Um, or you run an experiment that's very short, and you actually don't go through the whole process of spending many weeks or months draining the battery. The other thing that it's important for is understanding, is having the ability to do voltage modeling lets you do voltage regulation. And that's the interface between the battery and the device. You don't just stick the battery up against your radio. You need to control the, you need to modulate the voltage, maintain the output voltage at the correct value for the electronics input. And um, maintaining that is um, very important um, for the energy efficiency of the system. So that's something else that you can now model using something like KeyBAM in order to design more energy efficient devices. So thanks to many people. Um, my colleague working on hybrid KeyBAM is Christian Rohner at Uppsala University. Uh, some of the code was written by students in the Uppsala University Computer Networking Project course last spring. Obviously, I'd like to thank the Amnet team and especially the Vente who implemented most of the power framework and of course your patience in listening. So we can have maybe two or three questions before the coffee break. So please, that's one question. I don't really have It's not really a question about uh, the, the, the points you raised regarding the, the power of paper and the magnets. Mm -hmm. I'm, 
I'm certainly happy to see that. What I would really like to see is that the framework can support um, both this Watts interface so that it, I don't know if anybody is doing it, maybe show of hands if anybody's modeling something like a data center. Um, you really need that Watts Jules interface. That's the correct way to model a data center. If you have a very simple battery model, you'd also treat it as a constant voltage source. But if you have these more complex models, you want to be able to support both, and I think we need to have good examples of both. Then whether we want to put oh, kind of simplified or, or pedagogical examples of both, and then I think we can add um, more complex models. It's important, it's important to remember that these, these models, when they're parameterized, are extremely battery specific. You know, to a specific kind of battery, even to a specific manufacturer of battery. Um, but we're certainly happy to have, have the code in there. Um, but I, I think it's, it's, what's important for us is being able to support both, kind of both classes of models. Um, and I think it, it may be my lack of, I'm, what I'm not convinced that it's possible to do is to do that backwards compatibly. Um, it, it's certainly not hard to extend the contract, extend the base to, to take, take on both flavors, but I'm, I'm not sure we can do that in a way that's backward compatible for existing work. But you are a much better C++ programmer than I am, and maybe it is possible. I mean, it's, it's great that Onnet you know, tracks, or that iNet tracks the units on things so well. It, it prevents you from making all sorts of stupid mistakes. Yeah, I know. It, 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 it at least prevents me from making all sorts of stupid mistakes. Stupid mistakes are my, my specialty. Um, but it, it means that it's less, we, it means we need to be more careful. It means we have to be, which is good because you don't want to accidentally let somebody mix a Watts based model and a, um, and a, um, an apps-based model. Unless, of course, maybe you're modeling a data center and you want to model how the data center behaves during a blackout. So not, not one of these little teeny tiny batteries, but supposing you had a data center that had backup batteries, you know, big, huge you know, set of you know, bank of batteries, and you want to model, can you shut down the data center in a, in a correct way? I'm just speculating here. There you'd actually have to have a, a, net, a simulation that actually incorporated both kinds of models. You, you, you had certain operations that you needed to support the, in, in, can you model, for example, that, that change over nice? So you, you'd really like to be able to support this quite flexibly. I think extending the contract isn't too hard. Um, the problem is all of the internals in the base class are really, really Watts oriented and I think we just need to do a little, we need to do something clever. Um, it may not be possible to do something backwards compatible and clever, <coughs> but I'm relying on the, the INET team to, to kind of make those decisions. Okay, is there any other question? What about like, the actual uh, recharging of, of battery? Uh, does that raise so many new issues too? So actually, um, oops. <coughs> so I actually left it, left it out. Um, the power for, so, so the power framework here, we have the, something that generates activity, a consumer, and a consumer takes, device, takes energy from the storage. The power framework actually has the opposite, or the analogous model as well. You could have something like a solar cell and a generator that dumps power into your battery. Um, again, it's the same very, very simple um, model. Rechargeable batteries are even harder to simulate than non-rechargeable batteries. Keybound is not as generally implemented handle recharging. It's, um, it's very hard to model. So if you, if you have your laptop there, there really are like four specialized chips in the battery managing that process and then telling you what's going on. And all it's trying to do is warn you, um, you know, to turn off your laptop before the battery fails. 
So it, it's actually modeling batteries here. And, and I know it, it probably came up as kind of a disappointment when, the, um, when these two curves didn't, didn't look really as much alike as you kind of want them to. Um, but um, your modeling batteries is really hard. This is, this isn't, and this doesn't even include temperature. Once you had temperature dependence, whole nother nightmare. Um, it's, the problem is that you, you want to make the battery model better, but I think the really important thing, because again, until you're modeling the load better, modeling the battery better doesn't necessarily help. But I think in terms of state of charge estimation, we really just don't know how well that works. We don't know um, how well that, how much that affects protocols. If you can't do, get a good estimate of your own state of charge, how can you do load balancing? So I, th I think there, there are places where you, you'd like to have this, this more sensitive model that can take into account some of these things, even if it's not terribly accurate. Because taking, into the account, taking some of these things into account at all, I think, is, is, is important. But charging the batteries back up, it, it's a whole other set of models. Because, you, for example, if you have a solar cell, you need a model for the efficiency of the solar cell even before you start um, trying to model how you can put the power um, back into the battery. So there are models, people do, do work on it, but it's very much an open problem. Everyone said that. And, and the, um, well, the battery people right now, they have more money than God, but they're not interested in these little batteries. They're interested in electric vehicle batteries because the people who are doing electric vehicles have all the money right now. So we work with the Uppsala Advanced Battery Center some, and then we show them the batteries we're interested in. They, just, they kind of look at us funny. And then we show them our <coughs> measurements, and they go, huh, those batteries do that? Wow. So, um, so yeah, no, recharging um, or energy harvesting, dumping power into a capacitor, you know, dumping power into a capacitor. Um, we'd like, to, it would be nice to get the power, it would be nice to get the, um, the framework to have the flexibility to support a range of models. And just work as a community on making the models have better fidelity for what we need to do. Okay, so, so this is days um, uh, on the axis here. So yeah, so this is um, so if we if we had a if we had a milliamp modern if we, if we had a um, a simple milliamp hour mo or watts based model, um, we basically have a linear discharge. It would be it would be it would be linear. And I think the voltage would be constant. The vo voltage would be constant because you don't and model the voltage. Yeah, the capacity we but the capacity would drop in a linear fashion. Um, the, and then when it went to zero, the um, you could do the you. Oh no, I haven't had coffee yet. It's not. I'd, I'd have to, what you would do, what you would do is you would do the math, and you would um. You would add up the the time here, times the charge, that would give you a number of milliamp hours, um at times volts. Um, so basically each pulse, each packet you were sending um, would draw this much from the battery. And you just you do that every, this is the packets are here are being transmitted every 100 milliseconds. So you would just be pulling that much charge or that many joules from the battery each time. And so you get a, you get a linear drop. And you could do the math if you've had your coffee. Um, right here, but it would be a, a, it would probably be an under, it would probably be an underestimate. It would probably drop much more sharply. Yeah, this is voltage, this is voltage, so the, it, 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 so would, be, would, be it would be constant. Point, it, would it, it would go, right, it, it would be constant, it would go to zero. And the yeah. place where it would go to, yeah, no, I'm sorry, I missed, but yes, this is, this is voltage. 
it would drop to zero, and the place where it would drop to zero, you could calculate arithmetically. Um, right. It would be, um, it would probably be, you could do the arithmetic very simply to actually get a number. It would probably be a short estimate. It would, it, it would be um, somewhere in here. It's a good topic for some discussions during the coffee break. So please uh, to give Laura this and another big hand. Uh, challenging, interesting topics, so I'm pretty sure there's a lot of discussions and the questions during the coffee break. So, the library, any comment or any announcement? Not so far. Okay, so to 11.30 we can have the coffee break and then uh, we will be back here. 11.30, okay? Thank you. So how about the panel discussion? So we will bring the chairs. Yeah.